But I want to go back to a question that you pose in the book that I had never contemplated and I have not been able to stop thinking about it and I love it, which is what's the evolutionary drive for multicellular life? So like, like let's talk yeah, through, a, you know, a, kind of, yeah, we go from these single cell organisms that have all of their own evolution built into them and then look at the complexity that we are today. I'd love, uh, you go through this very elegantly. Well, I mean, it's the, the let's pause for a second to contemplate single celled organisms. So they are bacteria, you know, uh, protozoa, yeast, etc. They're extraordinarily successful. You can't imagine how successful they are. They live in virtually every environment that you can think of. You know, they live in boiling water. They live in thermal vents. They live in inside volcanoes. They live. I mean, how successful is a single celled organism? So you could the, the the bizarre question that you should ask is not why uh, you should ask why we exist at all. Why is yes? Why, why what is the reason that you know we we have about you know several trillion cells or trillions of cells? How did we? Why do we exist? Why not? Why aren't we all bacteria? Um, and people have been trying to answer the question. And the initial idea in the eighties was that there was an, a massive leap evolutionary leap from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms. But what's surprising is that if you look at evolutionary history and if you look at all the evidence from evolutionary history, it turns out that multicellularity evolved from single-celled organisms, not once, but independently multiple times. And it's, it's you know, it used to be called a major transition it actually turns out to be a minor transition. Mm. In other words, there was a great evolutionary drive towards becoming multicellular. And you can ask the question then, well, if single cell organisms are so damn successful, why ever be a multicellular organism? The quick answer is we don't know, but all the evidence suggests that it has to do with um, several possibilities. The leading possibility is predation. So it's much more hard, it's much harder for um, a predator to eat a multicellular organism for several reasons. One of them is that it's bigger. Number two is that it has defense systems. Number three it is that it can move away from predators uh, through specialized apparatus, apparati. Um, uh, so that's one idea. The other idea is, is food and resources. Multicellular organisms can have, uh, you know, can access food and resources. Um, and there are other ideas about how multicellular organisms uh, uh, came to exist and essentially conquered the world, as we know. But that said, single-celled organisms are still the champions. We are just a minor fixture uh, in the world. If you took by weight all the single-celled organisms in the world and their diversity, uh, you would be shocked at how successful they still are. Remind us what Ratcliffe's experiments with yeast demonstrated. I, I that was, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I had never heard of that experiment before. So it was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reading this like I'm reading a thriller novel. Well, William Ratcliffe is a professor um, uh, who studies this transition, this evolutionary transition from single cell to multicellular organism, and he did this actually an extraordinary simple experiment, and he sort of just thought about thought about it uh, over Christmas. Um, with uh, Travisano, his uh, his advisor, he said, well, why don't we just take some yeast um, and culture them? And we um, we basically uh, allow them to grow. And, and so remember, yeast are single-celled organisms. And we just collect the sediment. So anything that's multi-celled is obviously going to sink to the bottom of a flask. We collect the sediment. And then we allow that sediment to grow again in another cycle of evolution. So this is sort of Darwin in a bottle. Um, so we allow that to evolve another cycle, collect the sediment, allow that to evolve another cycle. And by about 30 or 40 such cycles, he found that the yeast has, had evolved. And this is astonishing. I have pictures of this in the book into these sort of snowflake like multi fingered, multi cellular uh, forms, a really a new organism, a multicellular yeast. And what's interesting about them is that when he let them be by themselves, so no more recollection, no more sedimentation. They continued to propagate as multicellular uh, yeast. So in other words, a, he had basically created 
a new life form, um, which is multicellular. And what is even more interesting is that when he looked at these multicellular yeast, they started to acquire specialized functions. So you would imagine that one way that these multicellular yeasts could reproduce is that one cell could bud off and create a new multi-fingered multicellular yeast. That would be one way that these um, organisms could reproduce. But that's not how they reproduce. The way they reproduce is that a specialized series of cells that sit in the middle of this snowflake uh, commit a purposeful cellular death. And I, I repeat the word, they commit a purposeful cellular suicide such that this, this snowflake can break into two parts, two snowflakes, and grow out new fingers. <laughs> um, so this organism has now, evolutionarily speaking, learned, uh, the word learned Im implies that it has some consciousness, but that's not true. This is just an evolutionary uh, uh, process. It has created a specialized furrow in its middle where these cells basically can divide into two forms. And what's more is that he's now, Ratzel has done many versions of this experiment. He's done it with different organisms. He's done it with algae. He's done it with various other organisms. And what he finds is that there's even more specialization. So these, um, these new creatures, that's the only thing I can call them, form little channels to deliver nutrients. They form pores. They form secondary structures. So he, he's really sort of created a new kind of life. And just by doing nothing, I mean, just by allowing it to evolve naturally. And remember, this is 30, 40 cycles, uh, which may be, you know, 60, 80, 90 days. So you can imagine over the course of, you know, several billion years of history, the extraordinary amount of diversity and specialization that could happen in evolution that leads to people like you and me having trillions of cells, very committed to doing one thing or another thing or many other things. You know, because my kids who are, my, my boys are five and eight at this point, they're, as you can probably imagine, obsessed with dinosaurs. So we're nonstop watching every imaginable thing. I, I you know, I, I, paleontologists are the most important people in the world at this point. I can't help but wonder when I watch these recreations of what we assume dinosaurs to have looked like. I mean, at least we know about their size. How did evolution allow something so large to be, you know, in existence so many millions of years ago? And are we basically seeing a correction now? In other words, was was that just the pendulum swinging too far towards multicellular where, you know, boy, here you have things that can really defend themselves, that can really get away, that can really go after prey. But of course, they're too sensitive to a reduction in food or something like that. Or is that just totally unrelated? And had it not been for, you know, volcanic eruptions and things like that, maybe we just wouldn't be here today and dinosaurs would be the sentient, uh, higher, you know, um, higher order creature. A little bit outside my, uh, my pay, my pay grade in some <laughs> ways, but, um, but you know, there's lots of theories. Uh, I'm certainly not a paleontologist. So there are lots of theories about the, the extinction of dinosaurs. Um, what we do know is that, that, that you know th that these life forms were also very successful in their environments. The problem was, as many people have hypothesized, um, that um, that they they sort of reached a, a maximal capacity of size, um, and um, smaller mammals um, or mammal-like creatures um, were much became much more adapted or adaptable. To the environment, but there are a thousand theories about dinosaur extinction, um, including uh, changes in the atmosphere, changes you know meteors and various other volcanoes and and events, which uh, you know you can read in 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 most paleontology. Yeah, I just I just wonder if there's something about their size that became their downfall beyond you know the obvious external factors, and and it just made me think of that when I was reading that segment about. Yeah, the I mean, there's a beautiful the cell. Yeah, there's a beautiful essay, if I remember correctly, by Stephen Gould, um, where he talks about a natural biophysical limitation on size, and that's because the volume to surface area of any creature 
um, reaches a place in uh, where the volume to surface area becomes no longer sustainable because the 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 surface area of a creature um, does is no longer able to deliver the oxygen and the nutrients required for aerobic living. Yep. Um, I'd encourage people to read it. Um, I don't remember the name of the essay, but we'll find um, it. It, it, it will find it. It has to do with the uh, rhinoceros and you know and what the size limits of, of creatures uh, can or cannot be. Uh-huh.